Buenas tardes, buenas tardes, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, I apologize me, but I will speak in Spanish to introduce the, 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 the question. Um, para mí es un placer, un honor estar de nuevo en el Smart City Congress de Barcelona. Eh, el año pasado tuvimos la oportunidad ya de conversar y discutir sobre <coughs> contratación pública y eh, proyectos de Smart City. Este año el encargo es, eh, para mí es un honor con el panel que tenemos, eh, hacer una presentación sobre el, el proceso de innovación y, eh, en, en proyectos de Smart City y la contratación pública. En concreto, cómo el PPP, los, eh, los Public Private Partnership, eh, inciden en las Smart City desde una perspectiva de innovación. ¿no? Y también podríamos referirnos a la compra pública innovadora en los procesos eh, de, de Public Procurement eh, en materia en proyectos Smart City. ¿no? Es evidente que mmm, la contratación pública es compleja. Yo soy abogado. Eh, profesor universitario, pero abogado especialmente. Eh, la contratación pública es compleja, a veces les puede parecer muy compleja, a veces incluso les puede parecer incomprensible, pero eh, es evidente que tenemos que asegurar, las reglas están para asegurar la defensa del interés público y sobre todo un concepto eh, esencial, ¿no? que es la oferta más valiosa, ¿eh? la most value offer, ¿no? que en muchas ocasiones se confunde eh, a mi modo de ver erróneamente, con la económicamente es ventajosa. ¿eh? Son, pueden ser cuestiones distintas y veremos a lo largo de la sesión. ¿no? La segunda idea es que los proyectos Smart City requieren innovación. Eh, un paseo por, las, por, la, por el Congreso y por la sala de exposiciones, vemos cómo están ustedes, las empresas, eh, en proyectos de innovación, transformando la forma en que se pueden prestar los servicios públicos en el espacio público y, por tanto, esta innovación es inherente a este tipo de proyectos. La tercera idea es que estos proyectos eh, requieren una profunda colaboración entre el sector público y el sector privado, esta colaboración eh, leal, colaboración intensa, muy habitual, muy habitual en todas las jurisdicciones en materia de prestación de servicios, pero que en estos momentos hemos, debemos profundizar. ¿no? Y el objeto de la sesión, en definitiva, es eh, relacionar compaginar ambos conceptos, ¿no? el concepto de innovación esencial para los proyectos Smart City y el concepto de Public Private Partnership, ¿no? la colaboración público-privada. ¿no? Creo que es el momento es eh, muy adecuado. Eh, lo importante es que escuchemos a, a los eh, seis ponentes eh, de distintas jurisdicciones, distintos, eh, distintos acercamientos al debate, creo que nos, en, lo, nos lo enriquecerán. La idea de la sesión es unas intervenciones de unos ocho o diez minutos para luego poder tener un debate abierto con, con todos ustedes y poder eh, profundizar en los, que, en los aspectos que ustedes estimen, estimen conveniente. Eh, la primera intervención es de Lian Dodi. Lian es, eh, di, eh, proviene de la compañía Arup, una ingeniería especializada en proyectos de consultoría especialmente en esta materia. Lian, por favor. Um, good afternoon, and um, it's great to be here, and uh, thank you for coming along to this session. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, some work that we've been doing, some research that we're just publishing um, about um, city governance and IT spend and the frameworks that are needed to actually move things forward and start to deliver projects and, and deliver value and benefit to, to citizens um, in the digital age. Um, uh, just a little bit about Arup. We are a multidisciplinary um, consultancy. We uh, are in 60 different countries worldwide and we do work in cities, existing cities, in the built environment um, across multiple, multiple different um, dimensions, including uh, buildings, water consulting, waste, transport, and so on, energy, etc. I'm from the IT consulting group um, and I lead the smart cities consulting work that we do. Um, I'm going to, th this presentation is really I think going to set the scene for, for what comes later from my colleagues. Um, this is a, 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 a very complex uh, ecosystem, it's basically it's the London, the smart London ecosystem and it's a, it's a piece of work that we did for uh, the Greater London Authority last year where we looked at what are all the different actors that are involved in 
smart cities, in, smart, in the smart London uh, um, world. Um, it doesn't pretend to be complete. Um, it's a very complicated diagram as it is, and it's quite hard to read. But the main point is the yellow bits are government and the non-yellow bits are everyone else. And we've looked at the eight different categories. I'm sure there are many more. But there are, it, what it does is it illustrates the range of actors and organizations that are going to be involved in smart city projects. So smart city projects, um, by their very nature, are multidisciplinary and cut across multiple different silos within the city and, and, and stakeholders outside city government. So I think what this shows is that city government has a role to play. Um, but there are many, many, many other actors. Um, and in terms of spend and procurement and, and uh, uh, projects, these are also happening across many, many different actors. So there is investment and spending going on in the smart city across all these different places. So what is the role of city government? What, what can they do? Um, the next, the next uh, uh, slide shows how Again, city government needs to act in a different way. And the reason for this is that this is a, a slide taken from some work we did for the C40. And it looks at the different pa mayoral powers across a multiple different, uh, uh, again, silos. So what are mayoral powers in transport? What are mayoral powers in energy, in water, in waste, and so on? And, and what we see, ICT is this one, the small one. Um, and it shows that uh, mayoral powers in the area of ICT and telecoms are actually quite diminished compared to, compared to other silos. And, so, and this is because you know, a lot of spend, a lot of things occur outside city government. So, for example, investment in, ut in utilities and Wi-Fi and broadband, that happens uh, generally through uh, telecoms companies. Investment in um, smart metering. Um, comes through the utility company, uh, smart grid, smart uh, water metering, energy metering, again, all comes through uh, utilities. Um, but yet it affects citizens, and it, it, those things also affect the ability of the city, city government to deliver services to citizens, and they also affect directly citizens themselves. Um, so what can city government do? There is, there is um, opportunities for cities to do things in this area, but they have to behave in new, in new ways. Um, an example from another, from the sort of spatial, from the energy uh, field, in, the, in, the, um, in London, the mayor has no power really over energy. The energy is delivered to, to businesses and citizens by a utility company. However, the mayor does have powers over planning and very strong powers over planning. So by including a requirement um, for energy distribution, in, in planning, the mayor is able to affect the distribution of um, de decentralized energy and the take up of decentralized energy across the capital. So cities have to look for new ways in which to, um, to use the powers that they have. Um, and one of these powers is procurement. Um, we, ha we, we just did, um, as part of our research for the paper that I mentioned, um, we looked at open procurement data from eight different cities across the UK. And then we looked also at global, at global data um, with, um, from Gartner. And we found that cities are actually spending a considerable amount on IT. So um, from the UK cities, it ranges up to 9% of their, of their budgets. Um, it probably averages out around 6% of, of budgets. And that's not just the IT department. We found that actually spending on IT is located across uh, multiple different departments. And this is, high, high, this is not really surprising because, you know, we're here in the Smart City Conference. We're seeing that spending and investment and projects are occurring across all the different departments that, that cities uh, do work. But what we're not seeing and what we don't see uh, yet from a lot of cities is that governance around the IT spend. So if you look at um, finance or banking um, or manufacturing, they spend you know, comparable amounts on, on IT, but they also have governance around it. They will have board level representation uh, for, for their IT. Um, they will have um, chief technology officers, chief information officers, and a, a organization-wide view on how they should be using um, information technology strategically. And this is not something um, that a lot of cities actually have in place yet. 
um, and it really affects what they can do. The other point from this is that um, we, although we do need to find new sources of finance for some of the new, for the new things that we're doing, and I think we'll probably hear more about that, there is quite a bit that can be done with existing, the existing money. So some of the spending that we need to do is not new money. It could come from organising the money that is spent better and reducing duplication um, and, and, and in, in, sort of increasing the, the throughput of that. So um, how, what can cities do? Um, the paper that I mentioned is being published today. Um, we have put together a framework of seven different principles for what, how cities can act um, in terms of taking, you know, putting, putting a framework around what they do and sort of doing strategically aligning their spend with what overall the city is trying to achieve. But I'm just going to focus today, because I don't have too much time, um, on governance and financing. Um, and and this, this is a, a maturity curve, really. And it, it basically, the whole point of this slide shows that there is an alignment between how you set up your governance of your spend, of your IT function, of you know, your smart city, um, and how you then can set up the models for procurement and financing. Um, and this requires increasing political engagement and increasing stakeholder engagement um, to actually do this. So we start off with individual projects which may be usually funded through grant funding or EU funding or research funding of some sort. And then as we move up the curve, we start to get increasing political engagement which allows us to do more um, strategic forms of funding like PPPs uh, and private finance. Um, and then, you know, but what we need really is that organisational shift that allows us to look across all the IT spend and, and really start to do something strategic. And I think then that gives also the opportunity to then look outside the city and start to look at city networks and start to look at joint procurement initiatives. But this really requires a step change in terms of how standards are used, how governance is used, how collaboration is approached between cities and then across all those different actors that we saw on the, on the first um, slide. So I'm going to finish there and I'm going to hand over to my colleagues who I think will elaborate on the points that I've just started to make. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, um, Edna, please. Um, Edna is a leader of the innovation and knowledge management movement in Israel. And also, um, and she will uh, speak about uh, public-private partnership is uh, a key success factor for urban renewable. Edna. Thank you. Um, we have very little time, so uh, I chose to uh, tell you some stories some of the past and uh, some of the present. But first of all, first of all, who we are, um, our background is in something that I did my PhD in as a real pioneering program at New York University, NYU, in the 70s. Uh, led by Professor Neil Postman, some of you may be heard about him, and it was called Media Ecology. It was the first understanding that when you introduce technology, when you introduce media into society, something happens to people, not just to the pocket of the people who pay for that, but to culture, to behavior, etc., etc. I don't think that we need to elaborate on that. You can see that I still have some problem. I don't know if they are going to move my slides or I'm going to do that, but we'll manage in some teamwork. So out of this discipline, we have been involved in the concepts of knowledge cities that later became smart cities, um, and uh, the stories come out of that. Next slide, please. Where do I push? Okay, first story, and I have um, the initiator in the room. His name is uh, Mr. Danny Marian. He is the head of the Association in Israel of uh, Civil Engineers. Danny, raise your hand. If you want, you can ask him more questions. 
This is the largest mega project in Israel, very successful, that tackles the number one barrier from my point of view to uh, doing uh, a successful uh, public-private partnerships um, called BOT, Build, Operate, Transfer. In order to become a smart city, you need a lot of money. The municipalities don't have a lot of money in order to do them, so they can look at something that on a state level has already been done, both in Israel and overseas. In this uh, project, Danny and his partners had a, a partner from Canada, um, uh, and they all became very good friends. Uh, a second uh, project that didn't succeed to this day Just show me what I need to do. This one? Okay, thank you. Ah, no, we saw, I'm sorry about that. That's the BOT. We saw already a very elaborate uh, ecosystem from London by uh, the, the first uh, presenter. Here is what it looked like. Now, what was our role in this project? We had to deal with the media ecology that was created in that project, with all of these interfaces that are not easy to handle. Uh, some of them have joint interests, some of them have not so joint interests. You have to help people to work together and succeed to meet the project on time, and it was done on time, ahead of time, four months. Unbelievable. Not on time, on budget, on spec, four months ahead of time. This is something on my wall in the office. I have a poem by an Israeli poet who dreamt about the railway of Tel Aviv in 1936. To this day, we are very ashamed to tell you that Tel Aviv is a very smart city but doesn't have a metro. And the only reason is that the interfaces were not dealt successfully in this project as they were dealt very su successfully in Highway uh, 6, which I showed you uh, before. So it's very sad, but the partnership didn't work. A project that we are active now in with the municipality of Haifa, it's called Malal, which in, in Hebrew comes from birth to mat maturity. And the idea here, the uh, innovative uh, business model, is that you can pool resources together. And you said that sometimes you can just deal with existing funds, and I absolutely agree. Um, what we are doing there, the city is divided into neighborhoods. In every neighborhood, the head of the high school becomes the leader of the community, the community that um, is focused on helping the child grow from birth to age 18 when they finish the school system. It's sometimes unbelievable, but uh, people who are in the same school system in the same neighborhood meet for the first time because we initiated something that made it happen. It's really um, a shame that it wasn't done before but we are slowly, slowly helping headmasters and kindergarten teachers and uh, heads of elementary schools and the academic world and parents, etc., etc., to come together under the uh, inspiration of a, a slogan that Hillary Clinton made very uh, famous. It takes a village to raise a child. It does. And um, another thing that I... Uh, like very much from a friend of mine in the United States. She says, whatever the problem, community is the answer, and her name is Meg Whitley. In all the, of the disasters that we know from uh, the recent years, many, many local governments and federal governments, everything fell apart. What worked was the community. So it's time for a community to raise its children, but they need to do some partnerships in order to do that. 
Another project, this is a European Union funded project. We have been um, uh, focused in uh, that work f to stay uh, state of the art in what we do. This is to take a smart system and help rehabilitate patients after stroke at home. Now, when I talked to an Israeli businessman in the health uh, community and asked him what should be the target price for that project, he said, whatever. I said, what do you mean, whatever? <laughs> he said, one day at the hospital is 650 euros. So if you can get patients out of the hospitals a little earlier, you save so much money that whatever the cost of this system will be, we will buy it. So uh, we are doing that, but that's a, again a partnership. We have the University of Bremen, and we have hospitals from Austria, and we have development centers from Italy, and we have our own a consulting a company a focused on media ecology from Israel. Well, it is not easy to lead such partnerships, I can tell you. But uh, it's not the first one we that we do together and slowly all of us become friends and we are successful. Oops, sorry about that. Now, this one. Yeah. No. Okay. Oops. Technology. Still, we still have to go a long way, especially in the interface. Okay, till they fix it, I will tell you what I have next. So what have we learned out of these projects for uh, your benefit? We have learned that there are some key success factors in order to make public-private uh, partnership uh, work. It's funny that I have the seven principles from your presentation <laughs> here. That's teamwork. And teamwork is one of the key success factors in, uh, um, in my slides as well. I wish that somebody can help me find my slide here. But uh, in the meantime, I have great partnership <laughs> with Lynn. So, um, yes, teamwork. Um, Danny Marian, who, whom I mentioned, came from the private uh, sector. And we had a government-owned company um, which uh, took care of the quali quality of the building of the Cross Israel Highway, Highway 6. And I remember the conversations that we created together to make the uh, people from the government understand the interests of the people from the private sector and slowly, slowly to get trust. That's another, another key success factor that I have on, um, on my slide. Uh, to get some generosity on both sides. By the way, the fact that we don't have a train in Tel Aviv, which is such a shame, is because there was not enough trust in that project um, and there was not enough generosity. And when the private sector came to the government and said, look, something happened in 2008 and we need 200 million more for the project, which is not that much considering what it was supposed to be. And everyone understood why the government was not generous enough and they are going to do it themselves now, and I think that it's going to cost them 10 times more than if they stuck to the public-private uh, partnership. So how do we create this, uh, all of these elements of trust and teamwork and uh, generosity, uh, et cetera, and engagement and leadership? Um, we talk about conversing cities. We wrote about it. There are some peer review articles about it in all kinds of journals. If you want, we can send it to you. And um, um, if you can create a conversing city where the government, local and state and regional and federal and the private sector 
and the um, uh, startups and the civil servants and the uh, citizens and everybody, if they can be engaged and talk to each other and solve conflicts and create some joint interest, um, the conversing city can become a smart city. And of course, ICT has a lot of potential, not just to rehabilitate patients at home, as I showed before, but to do a lot for health, for education, for participation, for uh, energy efficiency, for everything. But we need first to be able to do some public-private partnerships to overcome the fact that it is very expensive to introduce all of these innovative systems into our cities. Thank you very much and I apologize for my bad interface with the technology. Very interesting examples. Now, um, Jorge, please. Jorge is um, Vice President of Governance of the Cámara de Comercio de Bogotá. Okay, Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos. En primer lugar, quiero dar un agradecimiento a los organizadores del evento por haber facilitado nuestra participación en este panel. Un panel en el que hemos querido traer una experiencia de gobernanza que permite facilitar al sector público el acceso a diferentes formas de gestionar los bienes públicos, el acceso a instrumentos, el acceso a conocimiento, el acceso a experiencia, a know-how, que facilita la provisión de bienes públicos y por esa vía evita procesos complicados de acceso a, a, a los bienes y a los servicios a través de eh, procesos de compras públicas complicados. Y antes de llegar al ejemplo concreto, permítame eh, algunos detalles en el modelo de gestión que desde la Cámara de Comercio, que es una entidad privada, eh, facilitamos la articulación eh, y la gobernanza para la provisión de esos bienes públicos. Coincide mucho con algunos de los puntos mencionados por, por Lynn en su, presente, en su presentación y básicamente el punto inicial del trabajo de gobernanza desde la Cámara es generar un conocimiento oportuno, un conocimiento creíble, un conocimiento independiente de la situación de la ciudad eh, a través de diferentes instrumentos, uno de ellos lo presentaré posteriormente y eso le permite a la Cámara tener eh, una realidad precisa, una realidad confiable y creíble de la situación de la ciudad e identificar a través de, de ese conocimiento cuáles son aquellos temas críticos en los que quiere trabajar para mejorar el entorno para el desarrollo de los negocios. Y a través de esos temas críticos, pues identificar cuáles serían aquellos socios que, que pueden trabajar conjuntamente con la Cámara en el, la construcción de un entorno más favorable, obviamente eh, definiendo los roles y las responsabilidades de cada uno de ellos. Y después de esa identificación y de la sentada en conjunto, pues se definen aquellos mecanismos o instrumentos a través de los cuales se puede poner en marcha una actuación eficiente que mejore ese, ese entorno. Y el ciclo o el modelo se cierra pues con la generación de espacios de discusión, de un diálogo permanente a través del cual se informa a los diferentes stakeholders, se informa a la ciudadanía y a los socios cuáles son los resultados de ese, de ese trabajo conjunto y, eh, y empieza nuevamente a través de los instrumentos de captura de información y de generación de conocimiento, el análisis de las siguientes fases de articulación público-privada. Y esto nos ha permitido, como lo decía anteriormente, generar credibilidad, que la Cámara de Comercio desde el sector privado genere confianza en las decisiones, en las recomendaciones de política pública y en su trabajo de liderazgo en algunos de los proyectos de ciudad que realiza conjuntamente con el sector público. Obviamente, eh, con base también en eh, procesos de diálogo y de rendición de cuentas transparentes. Con ese modelo, eh, aquí viene un caso concreto que eh, resulta de la aplicación del mismo. La Cámara tiene, desde hace más de 15 años, 
un sistema de información que le permite identificar y hacerle seguimiento a aquellas variables que afectan la seguridad ciudadana, la convivencia ciudadana y aspectos de la seguridad que afectan el desarrollo empresarial. Un observatorio de seguridad y convivencia eh, que se nutre principalmente de encuestas que realizamos dos veces al año. Por los últimos 15 años, 16 ya con este, hemos realizado cada eh, semestre eh, una encuesta que nos permite hacerle seguimiento a esas variables. Y simplemente, para traer a colación uno de los resultados, el, el, la encuesta que aplicamos al primer semestre de este año arrojó un indicador preocupante. El 32% de las personas encuestadas manifiesta que ha sido víctima de alguna situación que afecta su, su convivencia. Es decir, uno de cada tres. Eh, y la mayoría de esos son situaciones de ruido en las noches o de mal manejo, de los residuos sólidos eh, y eso pues en una ciudad como Bogotá, una ciudad de cerca de 8 millones de habitantes, no, es, no sería anormal si en la mayoría de esos casos esos problemas de convivencia no escalaran a problemas que pueden afectar eh, pues la calidad de vida e incluso volverse eh, eh, problemas de homicidios o eh, en casos más favorables de lesiones personales. Entonces, esta es la foto que tenemos gracias a la observación de esto, es un indicador que ha venido creciendo últimamente y a la luz de una sociedad que está actualmente en negociaciones de paz, pues uno pretendería que tuviéramos unas formas alternativas de gestionar esos conflictos. Si uno de cada tres personas dice haber sido víctima de una situación que afecta a su convivencia, ahí había un espacio de trabajo. Segundo paso, ¿con quién deberíamos trabajar para mejorar ese entorno? Eh, la Cámara también igualmente tiene un centro de arbitraje y conciliación, uno de los más reconocidos de América Latina, que trabaja tradicionalmente en poner a disposición del empresariado métodos alternativos de solución de controversias, orientados sí al, al, al sector privado para que entre ellos puedan resolver aquellos problemas que están generando conflictos, pero que ha generado una experiencia que gracias al trabajo eh, articulado podríamos poner a disposición de los actores públicos. Y evidentemente ahí viene un segundo actor aliado que es la Policía Nacional y en particular la Policía Metropolitana de Bogotá, porque son ellos los que deberían en cierta medida generar esas capacidades para lograr resolver conflictos que se están presentando en la ciudadanía. E igualmente buscamos experiencias internacionales, que es la forma en que tradicionalmente nos movemos, para identificar dónde estaban aquellas buenas prácticas que podríamos aplicar a un eventual modelo que diseñáramos para el caso concreto bogotano. Y aquí nomás en este país, eh, en Valencia, en, la, en el municipio de Vila Real, hay una experiencia reconocida internacionalmente de mediación policial. Sin duda que las condiciones no son las mismas, pero había aprendizajes que podrían extrapolarse y rediseñarse para la situación nuestra. Y de esa forma sale la respuesta, el proyecto, un proyecto que está en marcha ahora para facilitar la mediación policial, para crear capacidades en los policías para que puedan intervenir de forma eficiente en la gestión de los conflictos ciudadanos, que permita no solamente solucionar aquella problemática, sino contribuir, como lo decía anteriormente, a la construcción de una sociedad que resuelva sus conflictos de una forma diferente a la actual, de una forma no violenta y obviamente por esa vía mejorar la capacidad de, de prestación del servicio de la Policía Nacional. Actuación. Eh, hemos traído a los expertos o hemos llevado a los expertos de Villarreal a, a Bogotá. Por varias semanas estuvieron trabajando con los expertos del Centro de Arbitraje y Conciliación de la Cámara de Comercio de Bogotá y gracias a ellos se diseñó ya un, un modelo de formación que se puso a disposición de un grupo pequeño todavía de policías, estamos hablando de cerca de unos 40 policías que en principio recibieron una formación de cuatro meses en capacidades para dirimir y mediar conflictos que podrían presentarse en la ciudadanía. Hoy estamos aplicando ese modelo a manera de piloto en una localidad de Bogotá y en un municipio conexo a Bogotá, un municipio con altos niveles de conflictividad y estamos esperando en cerca de unos 10 o 15 días eh, estarán saliendo estos 40 policías para Vila Real, donde pasarán algunas semanas conociendo en el terreno la forma en que la policía del municipio de Villarreal en España aplica eh, los métodos de, de mediación 
pero sobre la base del de diseño de una herramienta que ya ha sido eh, piloteada en buena medida en la ciudad. A partir de ahí empezamos ya un proceso de retroalimentación, ya tenemos construida una línea de base que iremos nutriendo a través de la evaluación y el seguimiento en los próximos meses y con, un, eh, con el, el, la, la, la información que recojamos de ahí y la experiencia que logremos capturar y que nos permita hacerle ajustes al modelo, eh, ya está conversado con la Policía Nacional, será un modelo de aplicación a escala nacional para lo cual ya estamos diseñando los instrumentos masivos de formación que nos permitirán llegar a, a no solamente a las personas que se están formando hoy como policías, sino a aquellos que ya siendo policías requieren de actualizaciones permanentes en su formación y en sus capacidades. Este es pues un modelo a través del cual uno puede ver cómo la proactividad del sector privado puede contribuir al sector público a acceder a instrumentos que permitan mejorar la provisión de bienes públicos y por esa vía lograr objetivos comunes como mejorar el entorno de convivencia que afecta no solamente la calidad de vida del ciudadano, sino también el desarrollo de los negocios de la ciudad. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Now, um, Alberto. Uh, Alberto es full professor in computational science and artificial intelligence at the UPC, la Universidad Politécnica de, de Cataluña. Alberto, por favor. Este es el mío, es el mío, retiro para atrás. Aquí, este, este. Vale. Este es este de aquí, ¿no? Ok, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about the BCP pilot in the project, in the ECOR project. ECOR project is a European project, an FP7 a European project. Then our objective is to promote robotic innovation by facilitating cooperation between public, administ public administration, academia, and in in industry. Uh, the idea is to promote, to, to, in some way, to, to try to put robotic technology in any area, in any area, besides military. We are not talking the military area, okay? We are going in the civil area. Now, we have three instruments that are experiment, robotic innovation facilities, and PCPs. Yeah, but it's a special kind of PCBs, and I will talk uh, today. The, the idea is we have, uh, there is a project of 20 million euros. We have around 12 million euros for giving to uh, companies, administra public administration, or academia, in order that they develop robotic technologies in different areas. The first area is, the first instrument is these experiments. In the experiment, we have a total EU contribution of 10.2 million euros. And, uh, and then we, uh, this is uh, related in three different areas. One is uh, robotic for medical care. Another is for uh, industrial applications. And another is uh, service applications. And in these three areas, we have already made a call that has finished, that was in this year. And, and it's, uh, it's going to be a new call in uh, next June. In this call, they were presented around 140 uh, experiments, and we have selected 16. Then uh, we give to these 16 around 300,000 euros, and then they have to develop this experiment around 18 months. This uh, experiment uh, has used what we call uh, robotic innovation facilities, and that is what I'm going to talk uh, Well, In these robotic uh, innovation facilities or places that you can test your experiment without need to have these uh, instruments in your company. Could be academia has, could be the company that has, but this, and there are three RIPs. One is in, in Bristol for manufacturing, another is in France, in Paris for uh, medical, and the third one is in Italy, in Petioli, for uh, service robotics. Now, I'm going to talk directly to PCBs, and is the talk done. Okay, in PCBs, uh, what we have, the idea is the, to, to, to explain to the public administration that we, then they can use robotic technology. And we have taken two scenarios. One is urban robotics, and another is healthcare. In these two scenarios, 
uh, <coughs> the, the point is to uh, first to get what are the uh, challenge that they have, select one of these challenge. One of these challenge, we select also the, the public body with this challenge and then make, uh, make a call for experiments. This is the selection of the challenge we have already done. And then from this, I will explain now what are the, the selected uh, challenge and the selected uh, public body. And then from this, we will do the RTD prototype and then the trying this prototype in a small scale test series. The, the <coughs> RTD prototype will be, the call will be next January. And then the evaluation will be, well, the, the call will be open six weeks. And then we will, we will take uh, some of these uh, from each one of the scenarios. We will take three uh, consortia with a specific uh, RTD de development. And then from these three, we will uh, we'll go up to, up, uh, to three phases. The first phase is a design phase. The second is the prototype, and the third is the, the test in a small series. In the first phase, we will reduce from three to two, and these two will go up to the end. Okay, this is what you see here, and you see here the different uh, parts than we have. Actually, this is FP7's project, and that means that the people that will be in RTD, that will the consortia, will be partners of the project and will follow the rules of the uh, FP7 projects. Okay, this is the narrowing down to up to four. Now, uh, in this, the first, the first pass, we did an active search for this uh, challenge, and and these active shells, I say, I, we selected two, two challenge in two public bodies. And then there are the others. If you see the first phase, it runs six months and it will have three partners, three consortiums for each one of the scenarios. And they will get around 42,000 euros. It is not only a design uh, phase. The second one is the uh, second phase is the development of the prototype they will get around 145,000 euros. And the third is a, a test, small, small scale test series that will get a, around 290,000, around almost half a million euros is one of the consortium that gets up to the end. To develop what? To develop, well, uh, actually, uh, that, um, to develop actually a prototype that solve part of complete the challenge that has been uh, selected. Okay, this is, uh, this uh, PCP differs from the typical PCPs that funded the European Commission, because in this PCP, the uh, ECOR++ PCP, the, con the, the core of the project is made of academic consortium, and uh, the partners that get the, the, from the consortium will be RTD, the RTD will be partners of the project and they will be financed following the rules of the FP7 plan. That is different from the typical uh, EU pro, uh, European, uh, European project in PCPs. And actually, the public body is the core uh, consortium, and then the RTD or suppliers. Okay, now, uh, the process that we have done, uh, to, specifically to urban robotics, we identify 40 needs in the cities, actually, uh, most of them we took from the last year visit to a Smart City World Congress. We took from here. And then from here we evaluated these needs and then we selected uh, 14 needs from here. And this uh, with contact directly with the public bodies of all Europe. We have been contact around 40 public bodies around all Europe. And then from here we ask then send um, the proposals, and then from this, these are the 40 uh, needs that they were, well, this some of the 40 needs. There are the uh, urban challenge list that we identified talking with these public bodies for urban robotics. And these are the ones that actually the public bodies sent to us as proposals to be one challenge. You see different part, there is some infrastructure, another is ICT, 
another is mobility, another is there are different different uh, challenges that the European cities has identified as important challenges to be solved. Then from this, after uh, they were made by uh, uh, an expert selection and they selected as a urban robotics inspection and clearance of sewer network in the cities. That's, that is, has to be made by robots, by robot technology, and has to go through all the steps up to the end to, to make the real test. The city that was selected was Barcelona. Barcelona was who present this challenge and then we actually selected the challenge together with the, with the city. Other challenge has been very, very interesting and actually we think that the, in the 14, all of them has a very good uh, challenge to be a really challenge in the cities and can be solved by robotic technology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Uh, now, uh, Peter, please. Uh, <coughs> uh, Peter is the smart city manager at the Copenhagen Cleantech cluster. And Peter um, has changed uh, his presentation <laughs> due to that the tender is not yet uh, finished. But he will present a very, very interesting question about cluster as a form no, to, to innovate. Please, Peter. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to follow up on the on, on, on the point you mentioned that we have a what was a very innovative uh, tender at the moment, a big data tender, uh, and I was uh, hoping to present the results and the process, especially the process uh, today. But it's proven so complex uh, that uh, we won't find a winner until uh, January. So I'll come back next year and try and present that instead. So, uh, yes. <laughs> So do I. Um, so instead, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about what is the role of uh, the cluster organizations, the type of cluster organizations that I uh, represent, uh, and what can we do in terms of uh, public procurement. First of all, just to, uh, to give you a picture of uh, the, the, the type of organizations we are. Um, we are Triple Helix Cluster and we work within the clean tech industry. Uh, we are a non-for-profit organization. Um, so we have members that pay to become a member. Um, so we have the, the public authorities, this is the cities and the regions. Uh, and the way we see that as well, they are, they are the problem owners, they are the ones that need the solutions and they also represent the demand so, uh, so the market as well. Uh, we have the research institutes. Uh, who have the cutting edge, uh, cutting edge uh, knowledge and innovation and all the new ideas. And on top of that, we have the, the private companies uh, who have the solutions and have the ability to commercialize these solutions. I should say with the, with the companies, we have around 150 companies, uh, and it's a broad range of companies, cross-sectoral. We have startup companies, utility companies, uh, the big um, IT companies. So. Really, we have everything from, from, from the whole value chain, which is really, um, really, really interesting uh, to work with. And what we do in Clean is to bring these, these players together. Uh, we do that in, uh, in concrete projects, but we also try and do that in the, in the pre-procurement pre, uh, phase, uh, which is uh, something we are still trying to, uh, to learn from, but we have actually done this a few times. And after that, we also work internationally, but I'll get back to that. So I have actually been here to the to the Congress uh, Smart City Expo uh, for for three years, and um, in 2012 I went to uh, one of the sessions uh, where the European Commission presented their Smart City philosophy, and I was quite intrigued with that. And they said that each each city is unique. We know that there's competition between the cities, uh, but however there is there is the common challenges. Uh, they're all fighting uh, pollution, congestion. Uh, flooding and so on. So the philosophy is that well, we need to tackle these common challenges. Uh, we need to bundle the demand from the cities and we need to do that in order to attract and, and involve businesses and, and, and the banks as well. So we need to create the markets. One of the problems is that uh, who should do this? Who are the ones that actually identify the challenges? And one thing is to identify the challenges. The other thing is to identify the common challenges. The next step is then how do we actually bundle this demand? How do you get the cities 
to identify these common challenges and actually go together. Uh, and how, one thing is how to attract the, the businesses, but also what type of businesses is it you need to involve to get the best solutions. And this is where I think the role of the, the cluster organizations, especially the ones that, that uh, the Triple Helix cluster organization can play a really important role. So what we have done is to try and create this, uh, what we call uh, the Smart City Innovation Model. Uh, and it, it contains actually five steps, but I'm going to go into a little bit quite practical. What is it we, we, we are doing and want to do in order to, to, um, to solve these issues about the Smart City philosophy? So first of all, um, we uh, identify, try to identify the challenges in the cities or the regions. So quite practical what we do is so we go in and look at the, at the budgets, the upcoming investments, and we try to look at that in a way well, where there is what we call a smart city potential, where data, IT, and so on can be an important factor for the solutions. So this could be anything with climate adaption, this could be ITS, uh, renovation of building, etc. Um, so we do that for each city and try to do that in a similar way. So try to somehow to create a standard which is not developed yet. So we look at what are the upcoming investments and projects. And you have the headline and then you have the smaller projects that they have to invest in. So this is the first part. The second part is to try and compare what the, the results we found in these, uh, each of the cities. And this is the part where we say well, that's a bundle of demand. So if we look at six, seven cities, uh, and they have the same, the same problem. Uh, it could be flooding, let's take that as an example. So seven cities need to invest in uh, solutions that has to do with flooding, which is a common challenge. What would normally happen is that the seven cities would do each of their projects uh, alone. Uh, they would invite some companies, um, normally the usual suspects, uh, to find the solutions. Um, and. Uh, also, this is really costly for, for, for the cities. Um, so what we are trying to do here is to try and get the cities together. Instead of doing seven projects, especially before you start to commercialize this or, or procure this, try and go together and see, first of all, what can you learn from each other as cities? Uh, it's the common challenges. You might have some of the solutions. Um, but also try and identify these projects where we can get some volume, which is really important in, in order to attract the companies. So we have the third phase, which is the pre-procurement phase, uh, which is really the, the key one. Before you go out and invest, uh, and, and the smart city concept, uh, and some of these challenges that the cities had are, are extremely complex. So therefore you need to, before you start to do the specifications, uh, what is an actually, what are the possible solutions uh, to these challenges we have? And, and it can be really difficult because it's cross-sectoral, there's new technologies, and there's also companies, uh, not technology companies, uh, that have some solution that could be beneficial. So what we do quite practically is to, we present this challenge and we invite some of these companies to come in and comment on the challenges. Not, not so much to, to come with a solution, but just make the cities aware what is actually, what's available and what is actually possible. What do you need to think of? Can you actually solve more than one problem if you solve this, this, uh, this challenge? And what we specifically do, and because we have the volume, and in Denmark we have smaller cities, so for us it's quite a challenge to, to attract the big companies. Uh, we have some that's coming in, but we really need to attract the, the big ones to come in to solve these, uh, these challenges. So the volume is extremely important. But also the mix of companies that we invite. So who is it that can that have these innovative uh, solutions? Sometimes it's the small companies, sometimes it's a company that you know, don't normally work with. So we try to use the membership base we have to find these new companies and invite them to this process which, which we facilitate. So the result of this uh, can, can be many. One is that the cities get input to the specifications uh, that they want to do the tender. The other one is that you try actually and create new partnerships. You might have a startup companies that might uh, team up with some of the bigger companies. So quite often it's quite hard to introduce these, uh, these companies to each other. And the fourth phase uh, which we work at is the, is the tender, actual tender phase. Because we have, just just to give an example, eight cities, uh, sometimes we actually try and go in and lead that process. Uh, just because they didn't, we, we, we can do some things that the cities can because we don't actually have ownership of the solution. So therefore there's, there's space for, for innovation and new ideas. 
the other the other thing that could happen here is that several cities go together together and try to uh, to, to procure together have have a joint tender, or each city could actually go and, uh, and 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 make their own procurement process. But still, even though they do make their own procurement process, uh, you still have the volume that's interesting for the for the companies. So this is a work in progress. We are doing this. So it's it's not just a model. It's actually something we're doing in real life. Uh, and the fifth one I mentioned as well is that when we actually get the results um, uh, or the solutions for, to these uh, tenders, we also have some, some tools we work with uh, in order to export these solutions as well. So uh, I can see time is running out and uh, please come and see us at the Danish Pavilion as well uh, afterwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. And now, uh, Rafael, please. Rafael is director of the Central Europe of Aqualia. Aqualia is uh, the branch of FCCC Water Supply. And, uh, Rafael, please. Okay. Buenas tardes. Eh, yo voy a tratar de, de hacer una, un pequeño de, de, de zoom hacia afuera después de las de interesantes presentaciones de mis, de mis compañeros donde han explicado con gran detalle proyectos de, de gran interés que pueden ser implementados sin, sin duda en alguno de los vehículos de, de PPPs. Yo voy a tratar de hacer una explicación un poco más general de la diversidad de posibilidades que ofrece el, el marco de las PPPs y lo voy a presentar en un, en un ámbito de utilities, en un ámbito de, específicamente de agua y con una serie de ejemplos y de resultados específicos que espero sean un buen marco para una discusión posterior. Eh, FCC Aqualia, como, como habíamos presentado antes, es la compañía del grupo FCC que presta servicios de, en general ciudadanos, pero también de diseño y construcción de infraestructura hidráulica. Su cliente habitual es el cliente público, el, el municipio, las regiones, que también tiene cliente industrial. Es el tercer operador por tamaño a nivel mundial, dando servicio aproximadamente a 23 millones de habitantes. A día de hoy trabajamos en, en 14 países y tenemos una, una amplia experiencia en, en elaborar propuestas adaptadas y propuestas específicas para distintos entornos, distintos clientes en el ámbito de las, de las PPPs. El, evidentemente cada país, cada municipio, podríamos incluso decir, cada cliente tiene sus especificidades y por tanto requiere, como bien dice el título de la, del panel de hoy, de una actitud innovativa como bien decía también Jorge, de espacios de discusión, de espacios de, para compartir ideas, experiencias que permitan poner en funcionamiento unos marcos de trabajo que no siempre son fáciles. Yo diría que son incluso complejos en la mayor parte de, los, de las ocasiones, pero que dan unos resultados realmente sorprendentes en muchas situaciones. Eh, algunas de las características, retos que se suelen encontrar cuando se habla de PPPs, de colaboraciones público-privadas, y aquí no estaríamos hablando a lo mejor de, de marcos de trabajo como pueden ser las ciudades de Londres o Copenhague, o etcétera, sino en, en unos ámbitos en los que se desarrolla, yo podría creo decir el, el 80 al 85% de los proyectos de PPPs que se han llevado a la práctica, son eh, relativas especificidades que se encuentran tanto el cliente como el, la empresa interesada en proveer el servicio y generalmente son contextos de mmm, infraestructuras deficientes, falta de sostenibilidad de los servicios, en ocasiones el marco normativo no está suficientemente desarrollado para diseñar y para implementar un marco de trabajo como pueden ser las PPPs. En el caso de Europa se generan a veces confusión con la utilización de fondos europeos, que es eh, absolutamente compatible con las PPPs, pero no siempre es inmediato verlo. Inercias, problemas o dificultades culturales, tradiciones de procurement, de trabajo con el sector público, generan toda una serie de retos que yo creo que si visualizamos podemos entender mejor, que hacen a veces difícil encontrar ese traje a medida que hay que preparar para cada cliente, para cada situación, para implantar una PPP que funcione y que preste un servicio eh, adecuado a las características del entorno y del cliente que lo solicita. Este es un ejemplo que a mí me gusta enseñar frecuentemente porque es eh, en, un, en un ámbito teóricamente homogéneo como es el de Rumanía, en un ámbito restringido al sector del agua y en un parámetro que suele ser bastante homogéneo como son los días de cobro de clientes, en el, siempre estamos hablando de, de agua en estos momentos, 
tenemos una dispersión de aproximadamente 1 a 25 en función del municipio en el que nos encontremos, lo que da una idea de las diferencias, de las especificidades, tanto de la gestión de partida como del entorno en el que se mueven estos, estas colaboraciones. Esto es una dispersión en Europa, por ejemplo, de las tarifas. Yo creo que es evidente que los puntos de partida son diferentes, por tanto, las soluciones, los modelos, tienen sin duda que ser diferentes. Esto se ve en el caso de Europa, por ejemplo, eh, y no ya tan solo por los puntos de partida ni por las especificidades, sino por las preferencias también a nivel nacional en lo relativo a modelos de colaboración público-privada, tenemos muy distintos grados de desarrollo en lo relativo a colaboración público-privada. Tenemos países como el Reino Unido, donde la provisión de servicios de agua es dada al 100% por empresas privadas, casos como Francia con el 80%, en España estamos en el 50%, República Checa el 80% y otra serie de países que van poco a poco experimentando e implementando este tipo de, de colaboraciones y tienen porcentajes algo menores. Por tanto, yo creo que a grandes diferencias, a grandes especificidades, gran adaptación y gran flexibilidad por ambas partes. Esto pretende dar un marco general, de un vistazo, ver eh, las, los tipos de colaboraciones público-privadas más habituales en función del de tan discutido argumento del de nivel de implicación, el nivel de riesgo, el nivel de participación de la parte privada en el proyecto. En la parte inferior izquierda tendríamos contratos que podríamos llamar PPP, pero se acercan más a, a contratos de servicios, subcontrataciones, outsourcing, terciarizaciones de servicios de la administración pública, donde el papel del, de, la, de la empresa privada es prácticamente la prestación de un servicio, sin pasar a formar parte del aspecto inversor, del aspecto financiador, y donde los riesgos de la, del servicio, los riesgos de la prestación del servicio, no están traspasados al, al, a la parte privada. El extremo superior derecho sería el extremo, el extremo contrario, un extremo que existe en no demasiados países, existe en Reino Unido, existe en Chequia, en Chile, que es básicamente la privatización completa de, de un servicio donde el sector privado asume la totalidad del compromiso inversor, la totalidad de los riesgos. Y en medio tenemos modelos más habituales, más conocidos quizá, como es la, la BOT que mencionaba, mencionaba antes Edna en un proyecto en Israel, eh, o las concesiones, como, como más habitualmente solemos llamar. Concesiones de, pueden ser, yo hablo más hoy de agua, pero podemos estar extrapolando prácticamente los mismos principios a autopistas, hospitales, telecomunicaciones, energía, tienen muchísimos aspectos comunes. Eh, las public-private companies, que serían las empresas mixtas, que llamamos en, en España. De manera eh, muy rápida, tengo, presento aquí dos, dos ejemplos en los que se ve como en un contrato de operación y mantenimiento, que es una, una participación limitada del sector privado, los riesgos de operación no están transferidos al privado, tampoco las obligaciones de inversión, la relación con el cliente es proveedor-administración pública, mientras que en la concesión se da una traslación, un traslado de muchos de los riesgos de funcionamiento al operador privado, al sector privado, igualmente obligaciones de inversión, riesgos de cobro, riesgos de demanda, hay una implicación mucho mayor, mucho más profunda de la, de la, de la empresa privada en la prestación de, del servicio. Yo mencionaría dos factores clave a la hora del, de hablar de una, de una PPP exitosa. Evidentemente la comunicación, el trabajo conjunto que se ha mencionado anteriormente, el intercambio de, de experiencias, pero un intercambio de experiencias y un diálogo enfocado fundamentalmente a dos aspectos. La distribución equilibrada de riesgos, la distribución desequilibrada de riesgos ha hecho fracasar muchas PPPs en todo el mundo en muchos, y en muchos sectores y algo tan evidente pero a veces tan olvidado como es la simple sostenibilidad económica del, del servicio. A mí me gusta siempre destacar un ejemplo, creo, de buena, de buena gestión y de capacidad de adaptación de la administración pública en un entorno no siempre fácil como es Sicilia, donde la administración pública eh, concesionó, sacó a concurso una concesión de 30 años para la prestación del servicio integral del agua, aproximadamente a 3.000 ciudadanos, eh, que quedó desierta por dos veces. Se establecieron conversaciones, se estableció un diálogo y la administración rediseñó ese proceso añadiendo algunos elementos que lo hacían más viable. Añadió una serie de subsidios, añadió... Una, un aspecto de construcción donde el privado tenía algún incentivo más 
para la participación y lanzó de nuevo el concurso siendo adjudicado y estando eh, en el año 6 de, de 30 años de concesión. Yo creo que si estos aspectos que he descrito de manera rápida y general se ponen en práctica, como se han puesto en práctica en, en numerosos lugares y bajo numerosos modelos, sean de, P, de BOT, sean de concesión, sean simples contratos de, de servicios o privatizaciones completas, los resultados pueden ser eh, más que satisfactorios para ambas partes y siempre con un entorno y unas condiciones de sostenibilidad y de calidad también para el usuario final que es el ciudadano. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael. Uh, estamos en tiempo, we are in, in time. We, tenemos, uh, bueno, primero agradecer a los exponentes, yo creo que han aportado uh, distintas visiones, distintas reflexiones, todas ellas de, de extremo interés sobre el objeto. Tenemos unos minutos uh, para tener un debate con, con, con todos ustedes. Uh, si hay alguien que quiere hacer alguna intervención concreta, uh, genérica, sobre alguna de las intervenciones... Hi, um, my question is uh, for all of you who are familiar with these competitive dialogue processes and specifically I was talking to you and you, and it was uh, like really interesting. I am with the World Bank, it's an institution with a very risk averse uh, when we are talking with reputational risk and governance risk and so on. So specifically on competitive in, in, this, in this kind of procedures, you are, you are putting pub, uh, the, the public uh, officers talking to the, to the company, so there is a risk of conflict of interest and, and these kind of things may, may, be, may, may make it difficult to us to implement these kind of solutions or to, or to enable us to use them. So what is in general your vision about the, and because these are so complex, uh, so complex solutions and so difficult to design, this can be great for us. So first in general about competitive dialogue, I would like to hear your reactions, and then specifically about this governance or conflict of interest issues. Thank you. Please, Rafael. Para dar respuesta, yo partiría de una hipótesis básica de trabajo, y es la imparcialidad y la neutralidad de la administración pública. Especialmente en procesos de PPP, donde la experiencia en algunos países es limitada y donde los contratos, por ejemplo, pueden llegar a las 200 páginas, yo creo que la administración pública se beneficia mucho del input, de las sugerencias, de los comentarios, de los que posteriormente van a licitar. Evidentemente, esto no puede significar que se hagan concursos ni a medida, ni pliegos a medida, pero al igual que la administración... Eh, trata con el sector público, trata con eh, consultores, trata con asesores cualificados para diseñar procesos complejos. Yo creo que escuchar al sector privado que posteriormente implementará esta solución no puede ser sino una ventaja. Um, my experience has been that, uh, eh, The big success of the uh, BOT project of the Cross Israel Highway, Highway 6, was first of all because there was real leadership there. The person who was the head of the government owned company that was established specifically for this concession, for that build, operate, transfer uh, project, um, was a real leader. It's all, the bottom line is all about people and personalities and leadership. He was a real leader and when the government um, a people showed suspicion, lack of trust, lack of win-win with the private sector, he was there telling them that it's a partnership and in partnership you share risk, there is trust, etc. So I think that if the World Bank wants to succeed, the number one key success factor is to find a real leader for every um, BOT or any other public-private uh, partnership. Uh, the other thing that is very important is to 
keep not everything very, very by the book. I have this experience from doing lots of EU-funded projects. In every project that we participate, I tell them, listen, you are funding a project of four years. Don't you think that we have accumulated some knowledge in the second year, in the third year? So we want to change a little our de deliverables. Why don't you open up? If you want to go by the book, by the original proposal that won the money, you are not going to get success. So this flexibility, iterativity, sometimes it's called agile in software development, very important in all projects. Time control, openness to new ideas. Again, if I look at that successful project, there were so many things that were surprises that could have not been anticipated. And only because the, so, uh, the problems were tackled together and there was real strong leadership, uh, it was uh, so successful that it was finished four months ahead of time. You know, only 30% of projects are on time, on budget, on spec. Here we had four months ahead of time. That's a lot of money when you speak about a toll road, you know. So I think that these are open-ended, emerging process and a strong leader. Very important. Uh, Peter wants to, to, to take the, the word. And uh, later, uh, uh, yo, yo intervendré como abogado y contestaré también. <laughs> okay, thank you. I can see the time is, uh, is running out, so time be quick, but we can also speak afterwards. Uh, we, we actually have five or six of these uh, competitive dialogues running at the moment, and I think of course, the key thing is that it is extremely complex problems. Uh, that's, that's why we are doing it. Um, and it's also associated with a really high risk. And uh, I think for the companies as well, really, this has been dragging out quite the, the, the dialogues uh, because it's so complex. So, the, so the, the cost for the companies are really high. So we need to find, find out how can we fund this process in the, in, in the proper way. One of the things we do uh, is to actually, when we do this, to try and create a market. Uh, so one thing is that uh, with a recycling plant is, a, is an example of recycling of plastic is one of the ones we have. Uh, we, we do this for the city or several cities, but also if you look at recycled plastic, uh, to give an example like here, they only want to use recycled plastic uh, by 2015. So involve them in the process, they actually, so we try to involve the whole value chain in the competitive dialogue. So I think to try and think again, how do we solve more solu more problems but by looking at this one challenge and bring in several customers? Uh, I think that that's one thing we learned for sure. So, in in, in my opinion, en eh, tanto que abogado, eh, en la reflexión es pertinente en cualquier contratación pública. Lo que ocurre es que en los proyectos Smart City, en, en, con colaboración público-privada, como ha, se ha puesto en relieve Peter, Edna, es imprescindible la, la, el diálogo con el mercado, con las empresas, para la configuración del, pro, del propio proyecto. Entonces aquí la clave es eh, transparencia, igualdad de oportunidades. Transparencia, igualdad de oportunidades entre compañías. Eh, pienso que las nuevas directivas comunitarias de contratación han establecido vías de fórmulas, ¿no? la, me refiero a la consulta de mercado previa a la licitación, me refiero a la Asociación para la Innovación, articulaciones para permitir este diálogo necesario, imprescindible, entre mercado y, ad, y administración que necesita definir el, 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 el proyecto. Disculpen que, que he tomado la palabra. ¿Alguna pregunta más? ¿Alguna reflexión? Eh, sería, disculpen, sería las últimas, eh, sería la última y luego, si acaso, más informal. Uh, hi, my name is Xavier Marrero. I work for the City Council of Victoria Gastei, Victoria, Victoria Gastei uh, in Spain. Uh, this was a European Green Capital in 2012. And, uh, well, uh, I, could, uh, I was not able to arrive to the very beginning of the meeting, but uh, I don't know, you have talked about what public authorities need. What I've heard so far are, is what private companies are asking to public authorities for, for the procurement, but not the other way around. In the, in the CIDICS, for example, we, we, we are open to, to talk with different companies to, for, to, to uh, tender for services or for, for goods. 
but we also have the this um, this imbalance when we want to make specific projects or we want to uh, create specific services for our cities, but we are not able to do it because we are supposed to be impartial. And I'm going to give some examples of, some examples of this. For example, uh, we want to um, make a procurement to administrate electricity to the to the city. Okay, we want to be to uh, we want to make it 100% with renewables. And we want to be impartial and say, OK, we don't want any uh, utility which generates electricity with nuclear power. We are not allowed to do so. Uh, we want to create a, a kind of uh, ecological agriculture in our city. And we want local schools to be fed with agricultural uh, food made by the, by the local farmers. We are not allowed to do that because we have to be impartial and any multinational, any big company can enter into the process. So it's, it's not helping us to, to boost local economies and green economies. So somehow, uh, I, don't know, I don't know your opinion, that's the, the question. Uh, what do you think about this? This kind of impartiality which is making cities not, um, not controlling what the city really wants and the city really needs because we have to be always impartial though uh, within that there are, there are some things that we cannot be impartial anymore. Trato de, de responderte. No sé si en el caso específico de la energía de origen renovable o de los alimentos ecológicos entramos en algún tipo de colisión con algún tipo de normativa, pero eh, nosotros como empresa privada lo que tratamos siempre es de responder a la solicitud de la administración local o regional o nacional eh, tan específica y a medida como sea posible. Nosotros hemos dado propuestas, si nos piden un traje verde, ofrecemos un traje verde, si nos piden un traje azul, ofrecemos uno azul, ¿no? siempre que sea técnicamente posible. Por lo tanto, eh, yo creo que la imparcialidad eh, no está reñida con el diseño de una licitación, con un pliego, con unas especificaciones técnicas que sean exactamente lo que el cliente necesita. En este caso en particular, quizá nuestro compañero abogado pueda decir si hay algún tipo de conflicto, yo no lo sé, si hay alguna manera de excluir empresas eléctricas que tengan eh, origen nuclear en sus fuentes, pero, pero en cuanto, imparcialidad... Y, y licitación o requerimiento a medida, yo creo que, que no, no colisionan en casi ningún caso. Okay. Para, eh, luego contestaremos. Para cerrar, eh, ya porque estamos fuera de hora, Edna, please, eh, usted, tú cierras la, la sesión. Thank you. I would like to say that my impression, and I've been in this business for 36 years, is that we have too much regulation. And we all pay the price, and enough already. We need to have a few simple rules and let the partnership evolve. It's a matter of evolution, of co-evolution. You cannot predict everything from the first day when you go into great mega projects for cities, for regions, for metropolis areas. It's impossible. So we need to have some rules that everybody abide by, but then to leave a lot of autonomy to this partnership to evolve, to this trust, to, to suspicion to go away. Transparency, yes, I fully agree. Less regulation. Now, I believe that if cities become strong, they might slowly, slowly get more autonomy. This is what cities need in order to go into public-private partnerships.